there's nothing in life that compares to the experience of being the first person who sees a crystal. Yes. How is not everybody amazed by these things? Hey guys, welcome to another unboxing. We have a special guest here, Jordan Root. You know, a lot of people comment on our channel about how do I start a mineral collection? What kinds of minerals do you start with? How do I know what's good, what's not good? A lot of us here are mineral collectors, but Jordan is a professional mineral collector. He does this for a living. And so we're gonna hear a little bit from him about his story, how he does it, and we're gonna see some really cool things. I see you brought a box. Yes, we brought a few, but we're gonna start with this one because this was one of the first life-changing experiences that started me like walking the path of really understanding what these things were and how special they really were. Oh my gosh. I can tell that it's heavy, so I'm gonna scoot it close, close to me and get it from the bottom. This is a pyrite on hematite. This comes from the island of Elba in Italy. The island of Elba is a really significant locality and in my opinion produces some of the best pyrite in the world. This is one of the first locations that really started like drawing me into minerals. When I was a child, I actually lived in Italy for a short period of time. We ended up going to a museum and there was a a big bunch of different amazing minerals. I saw giant pyrites, I saw fluorites with all different colors that came from Italy, and of course got to see beautiful plates of crystalline Elba ice with all kinds of different colors. And at the time I didn't understand the significance of these things. Yeah. That wasn't necessary at that time. It was just getting me started because it was my first exposure. It's one of those experiences that you don't fully know how to take everything in. You're just kind of in a state of appreciation, which isn't bad. You don't need to label these things. You don't need to, to fully understand them all the time to appreciate them for being amazing. This particular one is an extraordinary example of I a pyrohedron. I that. That is so cool. I think the Matrix, it also has this like icy bluish tint. Too. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that I really like about hematite as a species is that its color is kind of deceptive. Yes. Almost all of the time. Hematite is actually itself a red mineral. Uh -huh. And if you do a streak test, you take it and you streak it along a side of a section of marble, you see that vibrant red. But then like, you know, you actually look at the specimen and it's like it sheens blue. Yes. It can sheen red, but it's actually, you know, unusual. It kind of tends to look blue or silvery or even like a jet black color. Yeah. It's a funky mineral. <laughs> <laughs> so you had your first exposure when you were in Italy. What, what happened after that to get you to really love minerals and start collecting them? Well, that would be the quartz event. I should open the box? I feel like you're gonna be the box opener. <laughs> Oh gosh, look at that. So this obviously isn't the mineral that I actually found. <laughs> However, it's a good representation of the material. So when I was 12 years old, I was living in a pool house in my grandpa's property. And my mom had been having seizures for a few years and I was actually her primary caregiver. At, at from 12? The, well, actually she started having seizures when I was nine. So that's when I started being her primary caregiver. I was wandering through my grandpa's backyard and I actually jumped over a stream. And when I jumped over that stream, I caught quite enough momentum to catch my foot on a stump and I went and when I fell flat down on my face really hard I got stabbed in the chest with something and I dug it out with my hands and it was clear and it was and it was six-sided and it looked a lot like this except of course it didn't have epidote inclusions in the center of it it was just a, a clear piece of quartz I didn't even notice that I was bleeding until I was halfway back because I was so enamored you loved it, yeah. I was so enamored by this weird thing that was sticking out of the ground I was like what is this the tip of the quartz that I fell onto is actually chipped wow so you chipped wow yeah no that's a hard fall yeah no like the spot still hurts like if I if I rub on it like it actually Actually, it You're, hurts a little bit. Quartz I'm pretty <laughs> sure I actually do, in fact, have quartz inclusions, which is an ironic twist. Yes. Um, so, you know, I brought it to my dad, and I was like, who cut this piece of glass like this, and why was it in the woods? And he was like, that is not glass. That is a piece of quartz. And here is my textbook on mineralogy from college. And at 12 years old, I took that and a dictionary, and I sat down and I read the whole thing. Wow. And then I read a book on, you know, macro geology, and then I read a book about optical mineralogy. I also got really into physics as a result. And up to that point, my educational journey was rough. I didn't go to school. This was something that inspired me to learn about everything, because minerals is literally the conglomeration of all science. Like, every single time you learn something about minerals, 
generals, you learn something else significant that will actually be applicable somewhere else in your life. Yeah. I just about guarantee it. Yeah, like, I can see that. And so the journey never stopped. How did you kind of transition to doing this professionally? I actually brought something that will hopefully help us tell the story a little bit better. So when I was 16 years old, I was 350 pounds. I was really unhealthy. My mom had just passed away, unfortunately, for, due to a complication from the aforementioned epilepsy. I honestly didn't know what I was doing with my life. I went to the Spruce Pine Mineral Show and a man named Terry Ledford found me and he invited me to dig on his mine. So let's take a look at one of the pieces that I pulled out of that mine. So, Amethyst? Yeah, this is Amethyst from Jackson's Crossroads, Georgia. This is the most significant Amethyst locality in the United States. Although I say that encompassing the entire area, not necessarily just Jackson's Crossroads. Okay. So at 16 years old, Terry immediately began training me as a, an extractor. So essentially my job was to go in, once we found a pocket, was to actually pull the specimens out one by one without damaging them at all. That's scary, but an amazing job. It's, it's, it is an astonishing job, because there's nothing in life that compares to the experience of being the first person who sees a crystal. Yes. Being the first person who sees something that's truly, genuinely amazing, and you're, and you're pulling it out of the ground, and it, and it takes it from surreal to reality. So do, do you have any tips for digging? Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, this is one of my favorite tips that Terry gave me, which was once you open up a pocket, sit down and eat a sandwich. <laughs> Because because when you open up a pocket and you see that and that adrenaline comes in like we were talking about when you first see the, the specimen the first time, yeah. you're gonna be excited. You're gonna be jittery, you're gonna you're gonna wanna get in there and you're gonna wanna pull these things out and you're gonna wanna do it fast. And yeah. the reality of the situation is you have to create a sense of patience. Methodical. Essentially. Exactly. Yeah. And it's essentially like a meditative state that you're trying to get into because the amount of concentration that it takes to pull these things out without hurting them is extraordinary. That is great advice. That is that is really wise. It stuck I with think. me my whole life. Yeah. So I brought in something else to show you guys from my first adventure and actually being a mineral dealer. It's from a pocket that we call the Skittles pocket. Interesting. <laughs> oh, I'm intrigued. <laughs> oh, a rain. I mean, I figured it was colorful. This is an iridescent hematite from Gray's Mountain. Sometimes also references an iridescent gurtite because they can be the same species on the same specimen. Just never call it tergite because it's a terrible word. Um, Don't do it. And this is essentially fancy rust. We're seeing oxidation on the surface of a hematite crystallization form. One of the first places that I had ever actually set up and, and sold minerals is actually the very first show I ever did was the Graves Mountain Open House. Okay. And at the time I was working at Walmart, you know, I was just trying to make some money to pay my bills and stuff like that. And I had taken up their only things that I had dug, Jackson's Crossroads Amethyst. I took up some stuff that I had dug the previous time that I was at Graves Mountain. My first weekend that I ever tried to sell minerals, I made $10,000. <laughs> So you're like, hmm. Only on this only feels things like that a I had done. Thing to follow. Right. I literally made my entire year's salary in three days. Yeah. That's a really significant return on your time and your effort. It sure is. Yeah, and it's changed my perspective about money because you know you're taught a lot in your life that money comes from big corporations or your job or things like that. They don't really tell you that you can generate your own money by putting yourself into something, and that's why there aren't as many artists you know, as there could be, and there aren't as, as many, you know, mineralogists as there could be. Would you say it's risky? Uh, yeah, I mean, everything is risky. Yeah. Every every choice you make in life is risky. Nothing is guaranteed. Yeah. Why why pursue something on your daily life that you don't enjoy? Right. That's just totally. not rational. Thankfully, my mom instilled this into me very well. She taught me that it's okay to go your own road. If you chase something that you're truly passionate about, you can turn it into something. Um, yeah, for Every sure. single time. It's just based on what what of yourself are you willing to put into it. Yeah, that's an invaluable gift that your mom gave you. I, yeah. yeah. I didn't get to have her long, but I, I, I appreciate every moment that I had with her. Yeah, that's amazing. So, you've got a job, you go to the Graves Mountain Open House, and you're like, why am I working that job? Yep. This seems like a much better option for me. Where did you go from there? From there, you know, I just decided what I needed to do was obviously I needed to continue digging, but I also needed to diversify my inventory. So I decided that what I was gonna do was I was gonna start trading 
some of the things that I was digging because they were highly desirable objects to other mineral dealers right. for things that they had that they didn't necessarily need. I ended up going to another show where a guy had a bunch of flats of Illinois fluorites. What he was valuing at the time, about $5,000 of Illinois fluorites there. And I asked okay. him if he'd be willing to trade those for Jackson's Crossroads Amethyst. And at the time I had some really nice ones. And so he was happy with the deal, I was happy with the deal, and we did this trade. But I ended up getting so enamored with the Illinois fluorites that I ended up not selling them right away. Over that time frame that I had hung on to these fluorites, the value of fluorites rose dramatically. And what had been what I thought was gonna be $5,000 turned into $75,000. So when they say timing is everything. <laughs> yeah, so I brought probably one of my favorite fluorites of all time. It's called Bird on a Wire. Oh, oh, I love that color. Yeah. Oh, that's so pretty. Minerva, which is where this came from, closed in 1996. And these are now worth extraordinary amounts of money because fluorite's soft and people yeah. didn't take care of it. Yeah. And it, a lot of the good pieces got damaged or squirreled away into collections or thrown in the trash. And so, yeah. Uh, disturbing statistic. I've done calculations on this a few times. At least 80% of all the minerals that have been dug out of the ground have been thrown into the trash. By whom? By people, you know, uh, people collecting minerals and, and, you know, somebody passes away and they don't understand yeah. that their grandpa was actually collecting really significant things and throw them away. Oh my gosh. Uh, or somebody Keep dies. Keep records, they... people. Right. Okay, so we're talking about Minerva, Illinois fluorite in general. Is that a, a more significant locale? This area was the most significant location for fluorite in the United States and, you know, people all over the world want to collect the fluorite from Illinois because it is so colorful, it's so diverse, it's so distinct in some of the aesthetics. Like, for instance, this one represents one of the most classic color zonings, where it has a yellow core, yeah. a purple phantom, and then going out to a, a bright blue phantom, yeah. especially with the color saturation being this nice. Fluorite itself is the most aesthetically diverse mineral in existence. It itself is actually colorless. Yeah. Fluorite is actually a hexoctahedron, and in, in the center of it is what we call the F center. It's where a fluorine ion would be. Well, if, if that is replaced by another element, and since a fluorine ion is relatively large and heavy, it can be replaced by a lot of things. Yeah. And as a result, fluorite can be a lot of different colors. It has this unique ability to shift its, its tonality and everything in just such subtle amounts. Yeah. No other species does it quite the same way. So you think you would, you would say that more than tourmaline? Oh, for sure, because also fluorite has this factor about it. It can have between six and 328 faces. Tourmaline can't do that. No. <laughs> no, it can't. <laughs> um, you know, it could be cubic with an octahedral face, or it could be dodecahedral with a bunch of hexoctahedral faces. Well, if a piece theoretically had every single face from every single potential formation, it can have up to 328 faces. That is a fun fact. Yeah. So... You've told us about some pieces that you've chosen to keep for yourself, right? Yes. So you you have obviously your business, but then a personal collection. Right, which is probably too big. Um, <laughs> no, no, we don't believe in that. I started just collecting the things that really just immediately sparked joy, if you will. So when I was a kid, one of the things that, that created that initial spark, that initial appreciation event the most was Azurite. We're gonna open this one right here. Okay. This also represents one of my favorite localities of all time. Sumeb Mine is, oh is a gosh. famous locality. It produces over 300 different mineral species. Namibia, uh, right? Yes. It's essentially a giant copper tube in the ground, and it, it just created the best paragenesis for mineralization all down that thing. When I was a kid, one of the first magazines that I ended up with had a Sumeb Azurite inside of it, and it was just deep blue, and it was Jimmy. It was astonishing and I just, I didn't understand how anything could be that beautiful and like I even had the thoughts and I still to this day have this thought, how is not everybody amazed by these things? Yeah. So this is a redeposited azurite. Like yeah, it's a it's a thin plate that was just deposited right on the top of that quartz, and the, because it was redeposited, it gave it the unique circumstance of being able to create these thin, extraordinarily jimmy needles. Yes. It's a very very special piece in that way. It stands I've never out. seen that. I've I don't think I've ever seen that. In it, it's actually uh, only one of three pieces like this that I've ever seen. That is so fun. Yeah, it's it's a. I'm, I'm kind of jealous. A I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I'm kind of jealous of your collection. <laughs>
once I started like experiencing the state of appreciation more, it started inspiring more deep thought about everything in my life. And it overall started enriching me as a human being. Well, we have a lot to thank Gems and Minerals for, I think. I think if there is a grand design to things, the purpose of these is to make us understand that appreciating something just because it is beautiful is truly healing. Yeah, I, I definitely think that things in this world can be extremely beautiful just because they are what yeah. they are. But another part of it is also being a freaking nerd, which is what we're gonna look at right now. <laughs> um, hey, nerds are welcome on this channel. So this one, I'm gonna let you go ahead and pull this out. Oh. This one, this is a very unique material. I don't even know, what do you call that? Layering, and it's not, well, I don't know. So what, do you so what you're noticing here is the distinction of its crystallography, the sharpness of its form. This is a pseudomorph. Ah. So this is malachite after azurite, a pseudomorph essentially when one mineral is replaced by another. So uh, it's not euhedral to the species that it is. Right. And if you're not familiar with the term euhedral, it's kind of like just saying it's shaped the way that we'd expect it to be shaped for that species. Right. So this is euhedral for azurite, but obviously it's not an azurite. It's a malachite. Yeah. This one is unusually sharp for being a pseudomorph. It is exceptionally well replaced because of the fact that you can see the distinction of its faces. You can even still see the texture of the azurite on the surface. And, and that's something that very few pieces of malachite after azurite really offer. For me, this honestly got me really, really going when it came to expanding my knowledge and understanding of these things. So this is where it transitioned from just being in a state of appreciation of its beauty to legitimately wondering, what am I actually looking at? Yeah. <laughs> when you look at something and someone says, oh yeah, this this piece of malachite, that used to be an azurite crystal. Okay, well, I need to know why. Yeah. Why is the malachite not banded? So you're referencing like the, the big massive malachite from yeah. the Congo. And so those bandings are actually are variances essentially in the quantity of copper. This one is, is crystallizing an environment where it's literally going from being azurite to decaying technically into malachite. Right. It's essentially, I believe, losing some carbon ions and it turns into malachite from there. So it doesn't create any banding because there's no variance. Yeah, there's oh, no, that makes sense. Right, there's, yeah. there's no variance in its, in it, on the atomic level as to where its color shift essentially should be. Okay, Jordan, you may remember we always take a closer look mm -hmm. at our, you know, I'm not gonna say our favorite specimen because they're all, like we've said, unique in their own right, but maybe one that catches our eye a little bit more. So, I know what mine is. Do you have one? Well, honestly, if I was gonna go based purely on aesthetics, it would be bird on a wire. Yeah, I think that is definitely my favorite. That is what I was gonna choose. But I don't know if it's just because of aesthetics. It's just for whatever reason, it's just, well, I mean, calling my name. It, it draws you naturally because of the fact that it's so jimmy and it has such good color and it has so much going on internally that it'll, it, you can literally sit there and stare at it for hours and still not see every aspect about it that's appreciable. You just look at the phantoms, you can look at the petroleum inclusions, especially because the petroleum literally follows this one particular phantom line all the way around the edge of the crystal. It's, it's a very unusual piece in that way. I just noticed that. Every time somebody walks into my booth, this is the per piece that they gravitate to first. Interesting. Well, I am just like all of them, I guess. <laughs> Jordan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your stories, showing us a very small portion of your collection and teaching us a lot about collecting and minerals and we're really glad to have you here. You're very welcome. I'm always glad to, to come out and share my knowledge and I appreciate you having me on here to help me spread my love of these things. Well, everyone, leave a comment to tell Jordan how much we appreciate him being here and like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Thanks for watching.